I know the feeling of receiving that art and how it makes me feel and how badly I want to tell the person who made it. A 15 mile run four years ago would have me on the couch for the second half of the day. Your fitness that you gain through that process allows you to do bigger things like that and recover much faster and easier. If I'm willing to put myself through that much training, 70, 80 mile weeks, insanely hard workouts, discipline with sleep and diet and all this stuff, like why, why can't I do something as simple as do the dishes as well? Like the daily grind of uh, anywhere from 8 to 11 miles that are done at an easy pace is the same kind of concept of putting in reps every day in your creative work and entrepreneurial work. I think there was a part of me that was really yearning to not have to go to church every week. Having to stay home every weekend was almost what I needed to confront what I had been feeling and ignore him for so many years. Like, what is this? Why do I keep doing it? Why do I keep having to battle it? Like, what's the point of going every week if I'm not really believing it? Maybe the most horrifying moment of my entire life was... Eric. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, we're rolling. Whoa. We're rolling. Oh, what's up? <laughs> How are you today? I'm great. Yeah. Yeah. Doing just great. Doing great. Yeah. Why are you great? Um, well, this is one of the most exciting times of year for me with marathon uh, racing. Oh yeah, that's right. Corner, so it's like two weeks, less than two weeks yeah. away. Yeah. The, you get the crisp. It's starting to get crisp mornings. Yep. Even though it hasn't been too crisp, it's been really, really warm summer. This morning training. was. It's pretty warm this morning, but uh, yeah, it's just you start getting all the all the vibes. Berlin Marathon was this past weekend, so yeah, it just gets real exciting. It's a big part of my life now. Wait, the Berlin Marathon? Berlin. Over in Germany. Yeah. You were there? I was not there. Oh, you weren't there? But I did Wait, wake up. Watched it. I did wake up at 1.30 to watch it. 1.30 a.m.? <laughs> That's <laughs> commitment. Yeah, I, didn't, I did not watch the whole thing. I was in and out of sleep the entire time, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Just tracking all that internet friends. Uh, and a lot of people had a really good race, so just kind of fired me up. Heck yeah, Chicago. As a, as a runner, um, as a professional runner, like... I wouldn't call myself a professional Okay, runner. all right, well, <laughs> good to know. I won't call you again. As an amateur... Kind of middle, 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 professional, sure. middle class, we call it middle yeah, class. Yeah, there we go. middle class runner. <laughs> um, is, there, is there anybody that you, not idolize, but fan over, like people that inspire you in the running community that you're kind of like, that's like your go-to person, you're just like a huge fan of? Yeah, there's a multitude of them. Um, but I'd say like from an elite level, you yeah. have everyone's favorite is Elliot Kipchoge. He's no longer the world record holder, but considered like the best marathoner of all time. He's aging out now, which is kind of sad. How old is he? Uh, he's 40 now. Okay. Yeah. But you can be in your prime all the way up through your late 30s, which is really cool. That's why the sport's so fun. Yeah, people like me. Yeah. Dads. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, but yeah, well, there's I like I can't be LeBron James. Yeah. But <laughs> um, put some hocus on me. I'm exactly. just kidding, not hocus. Hocus are out right now, aren't they? Oh, I don't know. Are they in? What's crazy? Someone okay. was telling me hocus are out, so I'm like, well, we just we just found out yesterday that the hocus CEO is going to pass through the studio next week. Really? Yeah. Because uh, that's our, exciting. Our buddy. Uh, so hocus are definitely in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to get a couple vouchers uh, to. <laughs> He's gonna come and like see creative life and running within our world in Chicago. We just had a friend ask like, yeah, for him to come by. So like, that was sweet. Um, but yeah, I guess there's some other uh, American marathoners that are really inspiring too. Um, I'm affiliated with BPN, so Parker Stinson is a huge inspiration, uh, along with uh, people on the team like Mitch Emmons. And uh, some of the top female athletes like Emma Bates and Emily Sisson. Uh, yeah, there's, it's all really fun to follow along, especially the major marathons when we're televised. A lot of people find it really boring to watch running, but I obviously pretty excited. What, what do you get excited about the most with running? Like with basketball, if I'm watching basketball, you know, if like, well, he's not there anymore, but if like Blake Griffin gets a lob and, and he puts it down, it down, like that gets me amped. What about you? If I'm watching it? If you're watching marathoning. 
if I'm watching it, I think what gets me most excited is a lot of the record races when people are like on pace to either break a world record or an American record, or if it's a really contentious race like the Olympic trials that just went down this past February. Those are really fun to watch. Or if I'm not watching, a lot of the, uh, the races will have apps where you can track the runners. So if you have like internet friends who have done video series like I do, it's super fun to watch their entire race like through the app to see if they can accomplish their goal. Yeah. And someone like, like watch the different splits or yeah, yeah. it's a live tracker. Yeah, live. Oh wow. So you can see the splits and then watch them live. So someone like Philly Bowden, she's a, a UK running YouTuber. Yeah. But now she's like on the top ten all time list in the UK with her performance at Berlin. She had a PR of two twenty nine before and she smashed it in Berlin with two twenty five. And just like came out of nowhere. So that kind of stuff like really fires me up. Yeah. Because like I've gone back and forth with her in DMs. So like having a personal connection with somebody like that and then seeing them succeed like that gets me super, super excited. Because I mean like everyone sees themselves in other people as well. Yeah. And so you kind of look at it and you're like, okay, that a day like that could be coming for me. Um, not to, you know, look at it through a, a selfish perspective, but mm -hmm. I think that's what's really cool about the running community is a lot of a lot of people find connections through empathy in the same exact race distance that we all kind of partake in in our own. Yeah, yeah. I guess the yeah the threshold is like here, so or like the the activity you're doing is the exact same. It's just how you attack it, how you go yes. through the journey. Of it, so. Yeah, that's funny you said threshold because that's a winning term. So. Oh, it is. Yeah. What like VO two max or? Oh, you know some. I know a little bit. Yeah. Fun fact, um, I was in college for two years before I dropped out. <laughs> Good on you, man. College is dumb. It's so dumb. We don't have to talk about that today. Oh, I would love to talk about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was in college for two years and I was studying first to be a physical therapist and then kind of transitioned to like going into a master's for sports psychology. So, dude, I was in all the kinesiology classes and I was running VO2 max tests. And oh, stuff. nice. Yeah. Very My nice. My VO2 max? Not the greatest, but we're working on it. Okay. Yeah. Always room for improvement. Always. Yeah. Always. And I think that's, like, honestly, getting into the meat of the combo today. Um, that's kind of, like, one big thing I'm learning right now. Because um, I kind of grew up in kind of like a culture of, like, you almost can't fit, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even talking about faith, like, legalism, you can't fail. And if you fail, you're going to hell. You know, like, if you sin, you're going to hell. But when it came to, like, Athletics and stuff too, there was just some immense pressure put on you as an athlete. And if you failed, if you um, weren't up to par, uh, then you were looked down upon. So it kind of created like a negative relationship with fitness in itself, mm -hmm. outside of sports, outside of athletics. So in the past couple years, I've been trying to like build that back up. I like broke it down completely. And it was like, you know what? Like last year, I started running again actually. And you know, I was like, you know what? instead of trying to push myself for like two miles, three miles, um, I'm gonna run until I feel like lightheaded of sorts or until I feel like I can't really go anymore mentally and then I'm gonna stop. And then I'm just gonna focus on every day showing up and doing that. And within a week I ran like two and a half miles, you know, like I went that, that normal mile pace and then I got to the mile, I'm like, oh, I want to keep going. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like important to have that mentality. It's been a rewiring in my brain, but it's really helped a lot mm -hmm. in everything too. Yeah, there's plenty of metaphors uh, that you can discuss that yeah. I'm sure we'll look into. Hundred percent. For you though, with running specifically, um, like, how has that impacted the rest of your life? Like, because you talk, you, I researched you a little bit, like on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you talk a lot about. Obviously, have your running channel, but um, like, how does that really impact the rest of your like family business? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really multi-layered response, I sure. guess you could say, because in in middle school, I was really competitive, like within you know my, my district on the track and in cross country. And there was a lot of pressure for me to win meets and to, to race fast. 
and I was successful in, in that, but I really hated the sport a lot, and a lot of it had to do with the pressure yeah. uh, of always winning a meet or whatever. And my friends would come up and be like, all right, so you're going to win today, and mm -hmm. I just didn't enjoy that. So I chose not to run in high school, did a bunch of other things, um, arts and other sports. And I didn't really come back to running until it was in between my freshman and sophomore year of college, where I actually I was involved in a crew on campus. Oh yeah, I heard. And I was on what they called summer project in Ocean City, New Jersey. Okay. And one of the big verses was when Paul and Romans uh, was talking about running the race and during the faith. So that metaphor was reiterated a lot in those weeks. And I was like, well, let's let's get real practical with it. And I was like, well, I'm just going to try to actually run um, mm -hmm. through this trip. And one of the days I just went out and ran 10 miles. Wow. And it was pretty difficult and really had no idea what I was doing. But it was kind of that thing where like, all right, I'm an adult now. I'm 18, 19 years old. I always wanted to run a bit farther than you know your, your typical three to four, whatever. And so I just kind of went the length of the island and used it as time to, to pray. And I mean, as we get deeper into the conversation, like that was a very different version of myself. Mm -hmm. And and so it was rooted in that. And that didn't really develop any kind of consistency in running. But that kind of laid a foundation for me in recognizing, like, you could do hard things, like physically, you could do hard things. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't really until we had our second kid, so fast forward, you know, seven years, <laughs> and I was getting, I was the most out of shape I'd been in adulthood, and that just lit a fire in me to get back to running and find some more discipline. So to answer the question, I think. And really, one of the biggest metaphors I, I like to hammer with um, with running is that the discipline of doing it breeds more discipline throughout the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And so, even most recently, um, I equated my marathon training to the discipline of washing the dishes at home with my wife, because that's been a constant argument we've had in our marriage over the course of eleven years. And I was always under the impression, like, as long as it got done, it got yeah. done. Yeah. But she really, really... Don't sweat it. Yeah. She really wanted me to get it done before we went to bed. Yeah. And that was, like, that was really important to her. And so I would fight that like crazy. And I fought it in a lot of different ways with, like, being organized, clothes on the floor versus in the laundry basket. And that's a common yeah. thing that guys <laughs> struggle with to... Uh, to Put the clothes in the basket. <laughs> you ever see that meme where the dude's like, uh, he's like bragging to his wife, like, it's like, babe, I think there's like something magic in this house or whatever. It's like every time I put, you know, the clothes on the uh, on the couch, like the, the next morning they're gone. I'm like I'm, they're folded in my. <laughs> She's just sitting there like ready to mm -hmm. throw hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I even just most recently like in kind of. Alternatively, from how it started with that first 10-mile uh, run, started to become something that was pretty self-centered and, and like I want to, I want to meet these goals. I want to keep pushing myself and figure out what my capacity is, and not realizing that her supporting me in that endeavor should breed discipline across more than running, because if I'm willing to put myself through that much training, 70, 80 mile weeks and insanely hard workouts and discipline with sleep and diet and all this stuff like that's really hard and racing the marathon is really hard like why why can't I do something as simple as do the dishes as well mm -hmm. and so it's really taught me that the act of doing it and it could be equated to a lot of different physical exercises um, the act of doing it shouldn't read any kind of like sloth in you to only focus on recovering and, and not uh, try to expend any other energy outside of your discipline athletically, but rather that it can motivate so much more 
in your life to um, you know grow in relationships to be disciplined with tasks around the house with your work uh, it's yeah it's pretty wild what that change of mindset can do but the act of physically showing up can really manifest those actions mm -hmm. yeah 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 it makes total sense I mean if if uh, and I feel like if you're in a place where you're just like so tired from the physical activity that you can't even like focus on anything else then you're probably going too hard in that physical activity and, yeah. and you're going to get burnt out from it. yeah just like you would get burnt out from anything else so yeah more more just the consistency and showing up while still pushing yourself yeah but not absolutely dogging and killing yourself but the consistency over time is what makes the process more palatable because would you say it becomes easier yes yeah so before we started rolling, I said, what was that, three days ago on Saturday, I ran a 23-mile workout, yeah. which is the longest workout I've ever run in training uh, because the marathon distance is 26.2. It was just basically a 5K short of a marathon. Uh, so, But you never, I've heard you never run a you, marathon in marathon training, Yeah, right? you're not really supposed to, yeah. unless, like some elites will do it, but it's not very, it's not common at all. Yeah. So to do a 23-mile workout, which was insanely hard and like sure. really, really difficult, but even like during the cool down and as I'm walking back to my car, I was already like, oh, I'm fine. And like the drive home, like a 15 mile run four years ago would have me on the couch for the second half of the day. Yeah. So it's just, it's all relative and like your fitness that you gain through that process allows you to do bigger things like that and recover much faster and easier. So it's, it's twofold because you have to endure the process of like, getting fit enough to be able to be disciplined in other places but to your point it it makes most sense to not really push the needle too hard mm -hmm. because in that time when I couldn't recover from a 15 mile run that's maybe at that point was probably too much for me yeah that the fact that I was laying on the couch the rest of the day <laughs> yeah you know, but. and too much even like you're talking about like families maybe too much for your family too whether right. your kids need you or right. your wife needs you to yeah. do something and you're just like Bay line, cook, I'm done. <laughs> I can't do anything today. Yeah, and that's that's the really hard part because I mean, no matter what, you're talking specifically in marathon training. Like, if you want to be good at, at the sport, you're gonna have moments like that. So, if family is involved, there needs to be tons of communication and expectations laid out, so that you know, if that were the case for that day, we have a really chill day planned, or I picked a run that run on a day where we're all at home and we're doing a movie day or something. Yeah. And we're not needing to go to birthday parties and baseball and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Mentally, you can rest too. Yeah, because I'm sure it like takes a toll mentally to yes. get through that. So, yeah. Um, how would you kind of uh, equate running to like working, like uh, creative business, like getting in the weeds and actually doing the work that you need to do? How do you equate that? It's the same uh, level of, of consistency and discipline, like the daily grind of a anywhere from 8 to 11 miles that are done at an easy pace is the same kind of concept of putting in reps every day in your creative work and entrepreneurial work. They're not really significant in and of themselves. Sure, like comparatively, if you're not used to running a 10 mile run every day is a really intense thing. But for someone like me who's been consistently training for three to four years, that's just like that's just the normal marker each day, and it doesn't feel significant to me now in the moment, but every single, we equate it to, in the running world, metaphors of stacking bricks, mm -hmm. and the whole idea is, um, I came up with this paragraph the other day, like, if you're, if you're struggling to stack a brick, like one specific brick might be a mental hurdle to stack in one day, but the culmination of so many bricks over weeks, months, and years will be a home that you build. And when it gets cold outside, you'll either be stuck out in the cold or you'll have a place to sit and rest. And so that idea of like the daily consistency of one simple step leading to an outcome that is way more profound or overwhelming and uh, something you didn't think you could build, mm -hmm. that's when you find yourself in moments in business where all of a sudden you get this email, all of a sudden you get this DM, all of a sudden you're connected with this person, you have this lead, this inquiry. 
that you never could have imagined because every day you were showing up and putting in the reps and putting something out into the world and making art. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're setting yourself up for success in yeah. you know, in the terms. You're like preparing for the rain. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You're out in the field toiling because you have faith that that's going to happen. And something interesting that like I always think about is it's not necessarily you're not like working for that to happen. Right. Like mentally, you're working just because you have a conviction that this is what you need to do. Yeah. It's not like you know, oh, I'm gonna. Um, it's like for, to put into context for me. It's like. Oh, I'm going to do this podcast so that one day, like, I'm going to interview this person and then right. I'm done after that. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's, oh, I have this conviction, in my case, like, from the Lord to do this podcast because I believe there's um, a need for a platform to share these types of stories. So I'm just going to do it. Yeah. And if God down the road is like, hey, this specific person needs to be on the podcast because I need them to talk about this specific thing then he's going to put that on my heart and he's going to make it happen. And it's not going to be anything that I choose to do necessarily, except for the fact that I'm just like stupid. Mm -hmm. Which is like so convicting because I think right now, like the biggest battle I'm in is, is doing that, is like working in silence. It's kind of like a roller coaster for me right now. And I'm getting it more to that point where, you know, we're just at that threshold and we're cruising. Um, when it comes to the consistency standpoint, but it's still like such a battle. And I think whenever I'm in a place where that motivation is super low and I actually don't want to do anything, I come back to that. And that's kind of, uh, people in, I, I've been working with some clients in the VC world, venture capital, yeah. and they call it a North, uh, North Star, like entrepreneurs call it a North Star. And that term is kind of like sticking with me. I'm like, okay, what actually is my North Star and how can I go back to that? So that I can kind of get myself out of the ruts. Um, do you have you found like? Do you know what your north star is? Are you familiar with like that type of concept? Yeah, relatively. I I'm in an interesting place with my own entrepreneurship because for years I was building a building to grow yeah. what I have now, and now given my life circumstance, I'm not super interested in making that thing much bigger. Like, I'm actually just really content with yeah. where it is right now, but that wasn't the goal from the beginning. The goal, and I guess the North Star really was, how can I build a business and a life that allows me the flexibility to do what I'm doing right now, which is work about 35 hours a week, coach both of my boys' baseball teams. Mm -hmm. uh, like this morning, our you know, our daughter has a swan eye. You know, my wife is taking her in, but before I left, I was like, "Do you need me to stay?" And yeah. I could have, yeah. and I would have sadly had to cancel with you. Yeah, which would have been completely fine. Yeah. But yeah, you have that choice. Exactly. Yeah, so you don't it's have just this, like boss over. Exactly. So you know, I I might have fired you from the podcast. You know, <laughs> probably wouldn't have done it. I know. <laughs> it's just like we're done. No. It's like I've tried this too many times. All right, Eric. Good enough night. is enough. <laughs> No, this is the first time we've tried. Yeah. We haven't even tried. Yeah. Like, really just had a like, yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Flexibility. Yeah, I think really... And th that's nuanced as well because my life is just so busy with work, too. Like, there's trips, there's things, you know, outliers that aren't a typical 35-hour work week. But the past few years have been some of the sweetest years of family time because I've been able to build what I've built and it sustains with probably a dozen streams of income and I've built so much of a net of connections with brands and people that at any point if I'm in a situation where I need more income all I have to do is make a phone call or send an email yep. and it's it's not a problem yeah so that more than anything is so much more powerful to me than a threshold of income or making more because really when it comes down to it making more from where I am right now means more time working yeah and that's not the goal and so having a really clear picture of like I don't want to be working more than 40 hours a week how do I do that and how do I also provide for my family save for my kids for their teenage years and early adulthood, setting them up for success, mm -hmm. for retirement with my wife and I. 
And then with that as well, it's like we had our kids really young. We had our first at the age of 22, mm -hmm. and we have four. And so our youngest is three right now. We have 15 years till he's an adult. 15 years from now, for me, is 48 years old. Uh, and, you know, God willing, I'm going to have plenty of years of work left yeah. where I can have a lot of fun with entrepreneurship with kids out of the nest. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think very deeply about that. And so it really, I guess my North Star is mostly just making sure that I'm stewarding time super well for my family. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like like that being your North Star, basically the family time, the ability to grow with your kids and actually go come away with it with memories and also pass along things to them is the most important thing yeah. and so yeah you're chill for the most part yeah you know? and i <laughs> i think what's been so great is like for years i was wanting and hunting for more you know like but there's always one yeah it's exactly like there will always be something else that you have achieved so same same with the running metaphor there's always someone faster than you there's always somebody making more money than you there's it's just there always will be, and so this idea of, of being being content. I made a short film about it. Watched it not too long ago. <laughs> I told you before that. Yeah, I can't, dude. I'm a fan of your short film. Thanks, man. I like. <laughs> I I hadn't really watched it or watched anything that you really made, and then I was like, oh, I like look at a couple videos. You know, I'm like interviewing tomorrow, yeah. so it's probably something I should do. <laughs> and um, I'm guilty of it. You can ask you can ask Chris. I literally sat there and just like watched all the videos. Appreciate it. Very talented, obviously, cinematography wise and just uh, storytelling. But at the same time, um, for me, it was, it was just a lot of like calm storytelling and like very. It's it's not like um, even with the emotions, it's not like you felt the need to just like spike emotions. Right. Like you you have this knowledge of emotions where you're like all I need to do is like say this one line. Or have my wife say this one line about the issues, and that alone is going to like cause people to fill in the gaps. Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah, no, I'm a fan. I appreciate that. Me. Yeah. That's honestly that's a, a big part of, of my storytelling and filmmaking is I I never want to serve a, a metaphor or uh, you know like the goal of of the film like on a silver platter to the viewer. Yeah. I would much rather some people sit there and are just confused. Yeah. And have to sit there and be like, how do I work this out? I need to read the comments to try to piece it together. Or watch it again. Or, right. Yeah. Um, to fill in those gaps because, yeah, I want people, I want to make people work a little bit to find where they can relate to the story or if they can make it their own Yeah. Dude. You know what my favorite video is? What? Dude. I gotta show you. Stop. Dude, this is my favorite video. No. Do you guys have pulled up church stuff or something? Wait. Do you know about church stuff? <laughs> Is that what you're pulling up? Oh yeah, dude. <laughs> Bro, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is why this is why I left it in public so I could get roasted like this. It's so good, dude. Bro, it's but like, also it's so like, bad. Oh, it's so <laughs> bad. It's like one of my most viewed videos on YouTube. It's so crazy. <laughs> but like, it's the Derek room. <laughs> There's a funny story about this. So I was dating my wife at that point. Yeah. Or I don't know if we were engaged. It was around that time, maybe right before I proposed. And that KB album just came out, and Adam was like a big Christian hip hop fan. And he's like, "Oh, KB's album just dropped. You should listen to it." And that's the first one I listened to. And I was like, "Oh, this is a bop. This is fun." And so. You didn't say that back then, though. you didn't say Bob. Uh, I mean, I say Bob now. Okay, so, yeah. so I'm just trying to be relevant now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so We're not we, that far off. How old are you? Uh, 33. Seven years. We're not that far off. Okay. <laughs> but, so then, I went to Facebook, and we were going to just record like a dumb video on Sabria's wall, which is what it was at that time. Yeah. And the camera on my computer just wouldn't work for a video to post to her wall. This is right when I got the 5D Mark II. Mm -hmm. So I turned to Adam and I'm like, do, we, do you want to just like film it, film it? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, let's just go for it. So we threw on those outfits and then that's literally my parents' neighborhood, like in suburban Chicago. 
and we didn't even know the song. Like it was, was brand half, new, so I was half expecting someone to ride up on a trike. <laughs> I was like, this has to be in here. Like that was the the vibe that I got. And it, I think it we we put that video up on YouTube before he like put out a music video or anything. Mm-hmm. So when people search up the song, I think that's just that's what I recommend. Right. Oh, that's crazy. So that's why I got a ton of views. <laughs> Hack the system, bro. <laughs> and, yeah, and so there there have been comments over the years. People have been like, "This is my church camp song. I love it. You guys are so cool." And other people are like, "Y'all are so cringe." Yeah, so cringe. Can't dance. Whatever. So I've I've made a lot of videos private on my YouTube channel, but I keep that one there to keep me humble. Yeah. Oh, I love it, dude. I yeah. enjoy watching it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that song too, like, dude, that song is so big now, it'll show up in the most random places. Yeah. Like, I went to a hoedown one time, and there, there's a whole line dance to it. Really? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It's, I walked in this place in Oklahoma City, if you ever go, um, it's called Cowboys, and they have a massive dance floor, line dance is going all night long. Jeez. They got like four bars, and then they have, inside, it's a massive bar. They have a live rodeo that goes down on the weekends. Jeez. The Thursday through Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. It's a time. <laughs> but I walked in and church bat was on. I was like, why is <laughs> why, why is this happening? Yeah. And I go in and everybody's just on the dance floor, like having the time of their lives. They do it every weekend. I'm all sure. the time. Yeah. yeah. It's like a well known line I, dance. I could never. Dude, I tried line dancing last weekend actually. Yeah. My buddy Fun. Gabe had like a rodeo. Um, up in Malibu, like at this ranch, and someone came like top couple line dances. It was kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'd have a lot of fun with it, like one time. One time, yeah, and then get repetitive and boring. Yeah, I could. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too introverted. <laughs> I feel it. Like. Yeah. Um, okay, let's uh, switch up the combo a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I do want to talk. Uh, I want to talk about like your artistry and, and kind of like your progress there where you're at now, but um, before we jump in there, um, I just want to like talk about your faith journey, because mm-hmm. you mentioned like at times um, being in places where you were like praying a lot, and then, you know, we've had previous conversations where you're kind of in a place where you're, um, I don't know how you explained it, you, you were like not really going to church for a little bit, is that right? Or Yeah. So um, I guess where where are you at now? and and where do you have, where do you view yourself when it comes to your relationship with God, relationship with Jesus? Uh, so, I became a Christian at the age of eleven or twelve. Okay. At like church camp. Yep. And was very impactful at that point in my life because I had at a pretty young age recognized that I was hanging out with a crew of people that just weren't having a good influence on me, starting to like steal stuff, dabble in things, you know. So I recognized that and that change happened, whether that was my own choice or not, I don't consider it that, uh, really. And so my, my life really drastically changed from that point. I, I just, my character changed a whole lot. Um, I was much more interested in hanging out with kids at youth group and attending youth group regularly every week. And, was big on going to church as a kid and a teenager, so that continued through junior high and high school. I was wildly um, involved in yeah. in youth group trips every summer, mission trips, you know, like so did that whole thing. No, it's here in Chicago, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in the northwest suburbs. Oh. And so went to school at Illinois State University down in Central Illinois. Joined crew, and then. Uh, if any of the listeners are familiar with crew, I don't know what it's like now really as much, but at least back then it was a strong, strong emphasis on sharing the gospel around. Yeah, it is. Evangelism. Yeah. And so I felt pretty uncomfortable with it at the time, but it was like, yeah, like this is this is it. Like great commission, yeah. fully bought in, send it. Let's go. And so then you know was exposed to a lot more theological debates and figuring out like what I believe theologically. Nothing in high school was ever really pressed like that. And then like all my friends and crew were reading systematic theology and like, you know, the, the big heady books and listening and reading the Gospel Coalition and it's really fascinating to look at it 
backwards from now because so much of all of that has really been like blown to smithereens with controversy and leadership just falling apart. But at the time, I was almost more convinced that reform theology was more important to like discuss and preach and follow than what Christianity was at its core. <clears throat> It's like, so, a, it's like a lot of talking points. Almost. Yeah, like that was the main. Yeah, it was like here are the two conversations I'm wanting to have with people all the time. Yeah. It's are you following Jesus? If you're not, I need to try to convince you to. Mm -hmm. Or you oh you're already a Christian? Cool. What do you think about the five points of Calvinism? Mm -hmm. And like that was I just tried to drive that conversation all the time. Yeah. And it was selfish and. Like, no mean, I don't mean to criticize crew. I, I personally now don't agree with that approach, really. Mm -hmm. I don't really look at the Great Commission being served in that way. Could good things come out of that? Have good things come out of that? Yeah, I think for sure. plenty of good things have come out of that ministry. Plenty of bad things have come out of that ministry. I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. This is the case for any church, any ministry. You know? And so, yeah, there's a certain level of saltiness there. There's a certain level of that almost initiating some of what many would consider deconstruction for me or, or close to deconstruction or however you define what deconstruction is and it really left me with like they had a strong emphasis towards our senior year of, like you need to get plugged into a local church and blah, blah 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 but there was also a strong emphasis if you're really involved in crew that you should just you should probably jump in and be on staff Mm -hmm. And so it was like a lot of like they gotta fill roles. <laughs> yeah, a lot of breeding to like get people into staff positions, and I strongly considered it, and ultimately ended up not doing it. But I'm I'm pretty grateful that I didn't. I I don't, I'm looking at it now. I'm glad that I didn't really partake in that sort of form of ministry mm -hmm. um, with kind of how I view it now. Like, yeah, especially with how nuanced it is now for me with faith, it was a very long-winded answer, but through early adult years, post-college, we got married right away, had our first kid the year after, um, in 2014, and then the following three to ten years was just a battle of, like, slowly kind of in a monotonous way, just slowly letting go of all of it and just not caring mm -hmm. and just apathy. Yeah. So I feel like that really came to a head and when COVID hit. Yeah. Because then it was all of a sudden like, I think there was a part of me that was really yearning to not have to go to church every week. Although I consistently went with my family every single week up to that point having to stay home every weekend was almost what I needed to confront what I had been feeling and ignoring for so many years. Of like, what is this? Why do I keep doing it? Why do I keep having to battle it? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point of going every week if I'm not really believing it? Yeah. So... It's funny because God would agree with <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's a, that's a scenario with COVID where... I mean, I have plenty of strong feelings about all of that, but aside from it, when something so profoundly negative and difficult in life is presented to you, you're met with the reality of figuring out like what's at the core and what's at the foundation. It is that that catalytic moment in time in your history, recognizing like what is what does actually matter? Mm -hmm. What am I actually doing? When you, you're forced to stop the rhythms of your life, and, you know, the things that you love and hold dear are taken away from you. Yeah. And uh, so the, really those first two years were really difficult with COVID. It like, got worse. And through conversations with my pastor, uh, our, our church we currently go to, it was really just me needing to figure out and 
really kind of deconstruct the fact that I needed to have every part of my faith figured out. Because that college version of me was so adamant about the perseverance of sins, about the atonement, about the different parts of the form of theology uh, that I held so tight with a closed fist. And then even beyond just those silly fun points, it's like, there's so much nuance in our culture today and questioning what does it look like to navigate a Christian faith in a culture that is just like really in so many ways adamantly opposed to mm-hmm. the person of Jesus. And so it was a, an undoing for me of recognizing like, I, I personally, like if I, if I continue to believe the gospel. There's not much of me that can definitively say to others, this is exactly what it is, how it is. Here, it's more so just like, this is what I believe, These, this is how it affects my life. And really at the end of the day, I can't tell you anything with certainty. Mm-hmm. And that's really big, so we yeah. can get into like more yeah. of the specifics of that but yeah it's i i couldn't live with saying that i was a christian uh without having to kind of have that of just just allowing myself to say i don't know about a lot of stuff yeah and i think a a lot of bible believing christians are gonna (laughs) hear that and be like well you're not a Christian man, you're a universalist, you're a blah blah blah. It's like, okay. Like, well, it, I mean, it boils down to um, the conclusion, like, if you're just saying, like, I don't know, and you're just accepting that you don't know, or just like accepting the fact that you're just not going to do anything about it, um, that's one thing. But if you're, I don't know, like, you, it sounds like you're in a place where you're genuinely asking the question. Yeah. Where am I wrong? No, yeah, like, and I think that's that's more of like a genuine place to be in with your faith than being in a position where you're, you just read a bunch of books, listen to a bunch of theologians, and you're like, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah I know that. Yeah. Rather than going to the God of the the universe that created the universe and being like, Bro, huh. mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I believe. Um, and I think that's like more of a, a vulnerable place to be in. And I think uh, the simple gospel of just that like, God meets us in the most vulnerable moments that we're in. Um, and we're like the most deep in sin. And we're in that place where we just like don't know anything and are able to admit that. That's what he's actually going to pick you up and be like, yeah, it's okay that you don't know. You're not supposed to know. That was, I, I kind of resonate a little bit with that because for me, um, I grew up in the same Reformation uh, culture. I, I, I grew up uh, with my parents believing in Calvinism um, and believing in, uh, in things like predestination. And to me, I have definitely spent my time having the same conversations. And it's just, uh, it's, it's definitely a lot. And, and I got to a point where it kind of broke me down too. Like my testimony is that um, I spent my whole entire adolescence, high school, college years trying to do everything right by the book, trying to please my parents, trying to please like all my peers, all my peers' parents. Like I didn't want to do anything. And it eventually led me to a similar place of just like, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. I don't even want to go to church. I don't even want to talk. I don't talk to God. Um, I don't read His Word. I don't like hate, actually engage with Him. All I really want to do is just like go do all this other stuff. Um, and it wasn't until 
I actually started asking questions as well that I was even in a place where I could genuinely have a conversation with God and realize like the truth that he was telling me. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's definitely real. It's not like, I don't know. God doesn't call us to know everything. He doesn't need us to know everything. Mm. Um, he just needs us to be his children. Honestly. Yeah, the, the difficult part in that then is just then how do you navigate life then? How do you navigate the complexities of being a parent, being a spouse, mm -hmm. being a good friend or a studio mate? any of those circumstances without a framework, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a matter for me of like, sure, I have certain lines in the sand of, you know, what I read from, from scripture and I'm like, all right, bad is what I believe, but there's still parts of me that's like, and yet that can shift to, and I'm not opposed, I think it's more so of, I'm not opposed to being in community, having discussions about it, figuring that stuff out. Um, without it just being this co completely open-ended, like anything goes, I can be I can be convinced of anything. Yeah. It's not that I've really been convinced otherwise on anything um, regarding like, fundamental parts of the Christian faith, but it's, it's just understanding like so much more nuance in the way I relate to people. I think I was far more interested in not associating myself with people back in college mm -hmm. days because the the lines in the sand were so yeah. hard. Yeah. And now it's as long as the other person on the other side is willing to like disagree with me and still sit in the same room. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And, like I don't mind tension and belief and persisting in friendship and relationship. Because if I have enough humility to look at them and be like, this is what I believe and yet I don't know. I think, you know, that feels much more assuming to them, much less uh, judgmental. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, honestly, it's, it's some of my friends that aren't believers that even encourage me the most of the faith sometimes, mm -hmm. so it's just kind of funny. It's, I, I think I definitely grew up in the same place and only be around believers, you know, put yourself around people that are going to push you closer to God, which is true, obviously, like, you want to be around people that push you towards the truth. My experience, the truth is what God says. Like everything that He lays out um, in the Bible, everything that He lays out in His teachings. Like if you t if you put them to the test, they're gonna come through like every single time. Like they're gonna lead to um, greater mental health. They're gonna lead to greater physical health. Um, like there's nothing in the Bible that leads you to a place of um, feeling beside yourself, feeling disconnected, feeling depressed. They're all principles, kind of like you're talking about like running in discipline. Like that principle is going to lead you to a better place if you apply it correctly, if you apply it in like a healthy way, in a healthy manner. And so it's like good to have people that point you to that, but at the same time, um, I have like homies that aren't believers and they'll like literally come to me and be like, dude, I just love how committed you are. And I love like, the person that you are. And they like know it's because of my faith. <laughs> they like experience the side of me outside of God and in like in relationship with God. And they're like, yeah, I love you when you're, when you're like intimate with God. Um, and then they like keep me accountable too. <laughs> they're like, aren't you like not supposed to do that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they're like, oh, well, you shouldn't do that, bro. Hmm. And it's interesting to me how you know, like having relationships like that actually like, benefit, you know, where growing up I was taught not to have Yeah, because they didn't take me The former is not the way that Jesus said at all. So. It's a tough boat to swallow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just uncomfortable to do that. Yeah. Super. But for me, like over the years, it's become more comfortable. Yeah. To just put myself in those situations. Yeah. Because there was so much pressure before, and uh, again, from you know, ministry that 
constantly raggy. Mm -hmm. I have this duty and service, this that and other, to evangelize. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that pressure. Like I want to be able to meet someone where they are and not have to feel pressured to have that conversation with me. But they don't want to. But like ninety nine percent of the time they don't want to. It's more it's more about just like being there as a, a friend and actually genuinely caring mm -hmm. about what they're going through. You know. Just like you would want to be treated. <laughs> yep. So But at the same time too like not showing up thinking like you're their therapist. Yeah. Or you have this level up on them. Yeah. You know? Because the next day, the next week, whatever, they're looking at you and being like, yo, why are you behaving that way? Yeah. Going through the same stuff I was going through. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that in and of itself too shows the humanity in us all as well. And does, I mean, does that not preach the message more? Mm -hmm. You know? They're constantly feeling like you have everything put together. Like, are you really actually living alongside them or in a relationship with them? Do they actually know these things about you? Because if you just always have this facade of, I am holy, because, is that doing anything for them? Yeah, but that's, the, yeah, nothing, first of all. But it's not even the reality of what you are. Because you're not holy. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. like, why are, you, why are you pretending to be holy if you're not? Yeah. That's just going to break down. And, um, it's going to cause like more hurt mm -hmm. in the future. You, know? um, you just see, you see it all the time with people that are whether they build their put themselves up on a pedestal or they don't, you know. Um, and eventually it breaks. And the more you build it up, the harder it's probably going to fall too. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to push those people further away from the sure. truth. And you're just basically creating this wall between them and a real relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. because their relationship with Jesus is tainted through either just the perception of what you have or tainted through the things that you're telling mm -hmm. and then they believe those things to be true and they're just like built on this like facade of sand um, and they're never, it's never able to like actually get to the point where they can build truths and beliefs rooted in God's faithfulness that's not going to have any breakdown and they're actually going to be able to develop like a, a deeper sense of purpose and meaning in life that you know, I guess develop that more star for themselves, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I, I always like give this analogy to people, you know, it's a classic like build your sand on the or build your house on the rock and the sand. Um, we always uh, we always have like that person or thing that we can go to, like whether it's family or friends, that they're like a rock in our life. Like, you know, if you're at your lowest point, like where are you going to go and, and where are you going to find solitude? And usually it's in a relationship. Sometimes people have running or they have like some activity. Um, but I, I like give that analogy because you want, like the goal is to have a rock. And so if you look at like all the rocks that are out there, the possible rocks, <clears throat> there are a lot of rocks that are like pretty big, but they're also just like sitting on sand. And at the end of the day, um, whether it's death that takes someone away, whether it's the inability to run because you get injured, yeah. whatever it is, like there's something because we live in a broken world, there's something that's always going to take that away, and you're not going to be able to rely on it heavily. Um, but with Jesus, it's proven over and over and over again that you never be safe. And so I like look at that and I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to put my trust in anything, I'm going to put it in something that's proven to be there over and over again. And there's never been a moment where he's forsaken anybody. And there's just testimony after testimony after testimony of that. But people in like the hardest moments of their life and they're able to lean on this God, this creator, <clears throat> that um, is able to supernaturally give them peace, supernaturally give them healing, uh, and bring them closer to himself, and allow them to just be in a place where they still have joy for whatever reason. And that, to me, like always, I don't know, just like, it 
it puzzled me like why people like had joy in the like that. Mm -hmm. Or they were in men's pain. And then you would ask them like, why are you so calm and it's like because God's got me. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. But then you explore it more and more and you're like, oh he actually does show up mm -hmm. in tangible ways. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you so you said you like go to church now, do you consider that like uh, like a deep part of your life and how and like decisions you make and uh, even like your creativity like how do you interact with Jesus throughout all the things that you're doing even running it's it's still I'm still very much in a kind of rebuilding phase of my faith I I really don't like I'm not trying to push the needle in any direction I'm not trying to I'm not really trying to initiate that, whether I should be or not. Like pushing that forward, finding more discipline to read the Bible, to pray more. Um, and I'm sure plenty of people have plenty of thoughts on that. What yeah. what I am doing regularly with my family is is attending church very regularly, and I think it's really profound about our congregation is that. Like Brandon, our pastor, is, is a close friend of mine now, and it's a, it's a small church plant that is antithetical to virtually everything that's happening in the flashy American Christian church. It's a small community, uh, the, the rhythms of the congregation are pretty formal. Like we, uh, we say the Apostles' Creed. Week. And so those rhythms of habitual, like physical practice, are things that, for me, help me stay really rooted in something that is very <laughs> antithetical to what I would have wanted <laughs> ten years ago. I wanted the band and the, yeah. you know, the really cool graphics and yes. the fiery message and the pastor yelling and yeah. all of it. You really pumped up, bro. Yeah. And motivated for your 23 mile workout. <laughs> what I came to realize is like those people motivated me for years. And again, like some of those people taught really valuable lessons that I took away, but the content of their character faded and was challenged. And some of those people are no longer leaders. <laughs> and I'm just like, I have no interest in that flashiness anymore because seeing how shallow the approach was now, it made sense how it turned out. And so what I find really profound about what our church does now is that we have weekly practices that on face value to a young demographic would seem very boring and religious and these things are stables in the Christian church that have lasted for a millennium or, you know, and so like that in and of itself is pretty wild, but in the same metaphor of running an entrepreneurship and this consistency component, consistently like challenging yourself to say that thing maybe every week to practice that thing to take the bread and the cup every week mm -hmm. and remind yourself of, of these things is really for me your illustration and the biblical illustration of like what is a rock for me. Yeah. Like this is these are the core things that I believe with my faith. And while I do have plenty of questions and cons consistently say I don't know, one thing I'll choose to do every week is say this creed and, and pray this prayer and take this bread and cup and people might read that as legalistic I don't see it as that now I yeah. see it very much as this beautiful practice that actually elicits a lot of thoughts feelings, emotions, and challenges you to have conversations with people in your, uh, in your congregation in your community who also believe that same thing, 
because I think in a lot of church congregations, communities, like there, it can just stray so far away from some of those core tenets where everyone does just start to float, you know, not bring it back to consistently like what the gospel is, mm-hmm. what we believe the person wanted Jesus to be. Well, it's it's funny because like a lot of I feel like a lot of people um, there's like this massive wave going on of you know I'm not religious I'm spiritual or I'm not religious I have a relationship with Jesus but basically if you're not careful with that and kind of you're seeing like an opposite swing happen from like the extremely legalistic Christian Christianese like culture to now it's like well you really can do just kind of like anything you want because like you have a relationship with Jesus, he loves you, he died for you on the cross and you accept that. And to be honest, like that's really all that matters. And so like if you pray to him, if you talk to him, if you kind of read the Bible here and there, like, you know, we have the grace of God and so we can we can go go do whatever party out or do whatever you want. Um, and it also means like the reverence of God kind of like diminishes too. And so we get in this place where we don't have things that are constantly reminded of reminding us of what he did for us um, and how he did it and um, also just the powerful God that he actually is so um, yeah losing those practices puts you in a place where you are more susceptible to just like forget about that in the moment. Um, and so people are kind of like against the whole the religious acts thing but at the same time God doesn't like necessarily in the Bible, like doesn't necessarily command you to take communion every single week. He doesn't command you to pray a specific prayer over and over. But he does say that, like, drawing closer to him will change your desires over to be his desires. And uh, if your desires to be close to him, then you're going to be doing things that are going to keep you close to him. And they're going to keep you in that place of like reference to him. So, um, I think what we grew up with was just more of a, um, or at least what I grew up with, was taking those like good biblical principles of like, oh, we should want to do this, and just immediately being like, oh, well, if you're saved and you're doing this and that, then you're required to do this almost to kind of like make the decision for you so that everybody would be on the same page rather than just being like, hey, we're here, guys. Like, we're here to worship God. Um, and like, this is how I feel called to worship God. It, line, it lines up with like what the Bible says. Um, but like, we invite you to do your own thing and figure out like where you're at. And if you want to be in that same spot with us, like, go for it. But if not, um, like, that's okay. Like, you don't have to do it exactly this way. But instead, they just, like, kind of make the decision for you. The challenging part is, like, there there are specific calls to action, biblically. Like, when it's, when it comes to Jesus is dying with the 12, is like, this is how you remember. This is yeah. how you do it. Yeah. And literally being like, this is a physical way for you to remember what all this is. Yeah. And so it's one thing to say that you can feel passionate to want to do that, but where are you ever really going to find the time where you're just going to, like, out of passion, want to partake in that? Mm-hmm. Sure, there might be a call like, yeah. You read that scripture? Yeah, I'm going to just do that. <laughs> I think it's another thing for someone like me and plenty of other people who are who really struggle with the headiness of faith to then have an opportunity to really quickly do it because he has laid it out in scripture saying, I want you to do this. And I think there's, you know, not to get into like the, the theological deep end of it, but we forget the time. His, his body is not going far. Not yeah. saying, not going far. But, what I am saying is having an opportunity to change yourself to commit to that every week um, and showing up to do it. Again, you'll never know 
what is possible for you on the other side of consistently showing up every day. So in that same principle, I don't know what's possible for me with my faith or the outcome of what God has for me. If I don't consistently like, fall into a certain rhythm, it doesn't need to be communion, as to your point. Like, it doesn't need to be those things. But if God is saying, I mean, with the Lord's Prayer too, again, this is how you pray. You know, like that, that whole call to action, I think is pretty fascinating. So, it's always in balance, and I think it depends on the person, because. It, that could become something that's really realistic for some people. Right. So people go as far to be like, you just don't even believe in it if you're not taking it. Yeah. yeah, but you can also be on the other side where you are doing all the time and you don't. Yeah. You don't, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like we were saying. So mm -hmm. it's But like, I would challenge people to, to try to find some sort of rhythm yeah. or practice to have a foundation like that, whether that's just in a church, finding a foundation that does practice some of these things regularly, because I think it really is kind of like the middle finger to the American church and all of its problems. Right. Because all of what I was growing up was relationship. Yeah. Right. Okay, but Jesus does in scripture say this is not one to behave, this is, like, this is the most fun who is following me, this is something that is profound in nature that I have made. And doing that is, there's something profound about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're disciplining yourself. Um, and you're allowing yourself to, like, be disciplined as well mm -hmm. by, like, the teachings of the, the teachings of the Bible. Um, because yeah. yeah. like a lot of times I'm pretty apathetic to practicing it weekly. Yeah. And yet it's the discipline that keeps you. It's still mostly felt on the cross. Like every time I do it, whether I'm willing to partake in it, I force it to figure out like, his body was broken, his blood was swelled, and I remember it. Yeah. You know, the creed that like, we believe this, we believe that, we believe he died. Theologically, we can't have all, you know, but like... Well, on a more, on a more lax basis, uh, at my church, like, we take communion every week as well. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have, like, a designated moment after the sermon of reflection of prayer. Mm -hmm. So, like, lights dim down, and it's, like, no focus on the band, but the band is literally even off stage, it's just like... So if you're in the back, you can't even really see. And so it's, uh, I've like come to really enjoy it because <clears throat> it basically forces me to be in a place where um, I have to acknowledge the things going on in my life and I have to acknowledge what he did for me over and over again. And sometimes I've come into church um, in a place where my heart is just like, I'm like fighting. I'm like, I don't even here right now, I know the things that I've done this weekend have like interacted, and it forced me to be in a place where I have to like address that. And the practices that they have like, force me to be in a place. Uh, so it's like the same thing, it's not necessarily like a specific, always like a specific thing or doing. Well, I guess it is a specific thing, but it's not always the same exactly what you're saying, but it's the thing that God has given us to point our hearts back to him in the moment because we can get distracted like so. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not. Yeah, I agree with you. I like it. <laughs> it's it's um, no, it's uh, I think to kind of wrap that up a little bit, like it's encouraging to see you go through that and hear how you've like kind of gone through that um, and put yourself in a position where um, you like brought yourself back to like the heart of God rather than just like the things that people are putting in place or teaching you. Mm -hmm.
or whatever. Um, and I think that it's like important to acknowledge the hurt as well from a system that's designed to basically just, in a way, I don't want to use like brainwash, but like in a way brainwash people. You know what I mean? And put them in a place where their beliefs aren't necessarily their own, but they're just a series of thoughts that someone else has come up with, and now we're just passing them along to the next person. And maybe some of it's true, like you said, some of it does do good, but at the core, um, somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the form, you got says that I'd rather you just be away. Like you're in a more dangerous position in that way because you're not actually close to me, you just think you are. And it's like all or nothing to do. Uh, what about what about fatherhood? How uh, how joyful has fatherhood been for you? Like what has that changed about like the way that you approach even business and stuff? Like we talked about it a little earlier, but like how joyful has that been for you to become a dad? And it's it's an incredible miniature you running around. Yeah. We uh we didn't intend to have our first kid when we did. He was a surprise. And so it's really hard to, I mean, I really wasn't an adult without being a father, which is kind of weird. So I came out of college, we were married for a year, and then we had a kid. So I don't really, I don't really count college years as adulthood. It isn't. Yeah, it just isn't. I agree. So yeah, had, had basically one year without being my dad. So I don't really know. Yeah, I don't really know. I don't live without fatherhood. They're kind of one and the same. So I don't really know if like the question, how did it change you, is pertinent for me. It's it's hard because I what I can say is I was much more lax about it in the first four years. Yeah. I kind of was like, oh yeah, it's like our pet. <laughs> yeah. You know and. It is really fascinating to look at people who are my age now having their first kid and how much more serious they are about parenting than I was when I first was a parent. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a matter of maturity and that's an argument that people will hold over young parents' heads. Like, you weren't ready for it, you did. I'm not saying you did love and yeah. nurture our oldest just like sit out in the yard for the afternoon. We'll figure it out. It's definitely a learning experience, but I'm a much I'm a much different father to a three year old like our youngest three year old now yeah. than I was to the three year old uh, when he was our oldest when he was three. hundred percent. So it's I can see that in my my own dad too. He had ten. So yeah. There's like a bunch of us. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, he's from I'm the middle kid. From me and my so my oldest brother is a huge difference. From me to my youngest sister. And I think that's a pretty stereotypical thing that happens with parents. And not to knock on parents because I was in fight or flight at the beginning as far as being a provider. We had eight grand in the bank account. It was like, you don't, it's not much. Like, yeah. you don't have much to work with here. You're renting an apartment, you don't really have anything to your name. And now you have a mouth to feed and a future to build for him. Yeah. So diapers are expensive. Yeah, it was it it was a moment of now that he's here, I have to work very, very hard. And so I did. And that took a lot of sacrifice on the personal family front. But a lot of that time was me recognizing I need to work this hard now so that later I can that is available. You know, coming back to the point we discussed earlier, it's like that was the whole goal of this. You know, and I could have gone with the teaching career, and which I was in. Like I had a salary, yeah. and a small one at that. I could have progressed through that and managed my time as a parent and a family man that way. But in the same way of like what I feel was I to do. It's not be a teacher in the classroom. Like I think there's so, so much more that I can give to the world through my creativity that I went that route and both were possible, which ended up being the case, like being on the other side of it now. 
that's what I felt compelled to, to do. And so those years were a lot of balancing expectations and communication with my wife, especially as I was shooting 30 weddings a year and was busy on the weekends as well. But we built a foundation that was very, very robust and allowed us to have four kids. And yeah, now I'm at a place where I can work 35 hours a week and make it happen. So yeah, it's a lot of now, especially with our older boys, the first bird and beat conversation is just like, there's this huge moments that like, wow, this is like actually really happening. It's meaningful and impactful and not necessarily my experience with my dad. And so getting to relive these experiences through, especially with all the sons and eyes as he's navigating these new types and things, and being there to be alongside it and going for a walk in the neighborhood and discuss that. And then it's really impactful. Or even just because you're a tease. I think that's not everybody's phone in the interview. So it's, I don't know, there's, not, and that's enough of my dad, but I get this opportunity to build a legacy that like, I think is going to benefit them. I'm constantly thinking about that. It's like, do you, think, do you feel like it's like an out of body experience sometimes? Where you kind of like step back and you're like, oh wow, this is, this is something that I never thought I would like necessarily be in. Like, you kind of have to like reposition how you're approaching. Well, I think what's so interesting about parenting is I don't I don't feel that very often. There are definitely moments where yes, it's like man, I can't believe we're this far into it. Like, he only has half of his childhood left. It's always like, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. he turns that bird. Um, but what's interesting about parenting, especially like. You know, when you find out you're pregnant all the way to see the birth of the baby, it's nine months is a long time to process all that and get prepared and ready. And, it, and a lot of parenting is really intense, no doubt, but it's a slow, gradual build to more. And it's like most things in life where the intensity sounds like and they're running like this crazy 20 year now that sounds like the most insane thing you've ever heard of. But to me, I'm like, yeah, it's the hardest one I've ever done, but it's not outside the scope of the way that it's training the body. It's just not. It's this, it's this slow progression of like a step at a time, and you find yourself in these moments where it doesn't feel as intense now. Four kids now, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah it if doesn't, you first got married, you probably would have had a pain yeah. attack. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there's moments of intensity, no doubt, where every kid is screaming, and you're like, oh, whoa. Um, but most of the time, it's manageable because you took the steps um, to get there. Uh, but it doesn't take away from the really beautiful moments being. Super beautiful. Like our second, our second, you guys first come around and uh, come come back in the dugout and leaning back, and my parents are there, and I'm like making eye contact with them, and they're all like, oh, you know, <laughs> uh, not to like, <laughs> not to say that sports are everything or athletics are everything, but those are those moments of like really being formative, like, yeah, to for, kind of, for sure, yeah. yeah. Sports are formative, yeah, yeah. I, I, they're good. They're very good. I played ball growing up. I. I I think I wanted to play baseball at one point, but even one in ten kids, you gotta pick one sport and yeah. you roll with that. So like, mm -hmm. right, I'm but, but it's the same thing. Being you know, able to share those moments, you know, my dad was a member, so he never really understand like the culture of basketball. Yeah. But even just having him there for games and seeing score certain points, you know, um, and do certain things, win championships. It's, yeah, it's, there's nothing better than having people that. Raised you like be there for those big moments, mm -hmm. and yeah, I can't even imagine that dad, yeah. like how it feels. Watching your son do something that you love as well. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, I've seen him like race a few races too, and but especially after this, he's like pretty naturally gifted at it. So that's been like swelling with pride in those moments. So, and I, especially with our two oldest our boys, I'm really looking forward to the day when they're of. The age where they can run marathon and then I'm like, and we can actually like duke it out. Oh, uh, and we'll be able to like race each other actually. Yeah, which is gonna be very fun. It'll be a short window of time, maybe two to three years, but we can be competitive. And be really fun. I'll be on the lookout for that. Yeah, <laughs> but I'll be on the lookout for the short film that comes out about it. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, speaking of creativity, it's kind of like wrap this up a little bit. Like, you're um, you talk about like in one of your short films, I forget which one, but I specifically um, notice you talk about 
like basically creating heirlooms for your kids, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was like a cool perspective. Because uh, I, I don't know, for me, like creativity, especially filmmaking, photography, is um, an important aspect of it. Is like the memory aspect, of it. like creating things that are going to be viewed by kids and grandkids in the future, and how impactful that will be for them to see that. Because I know I look at my grandparents' photos that they've taken in the past. You know, I did a project on my grandma um, where I got to like lay out all the photos mm -hmm. and kind of like go through them with her. And she like told me stories and stories um, just by the photos. So yeah, it, it, to me it's like such a cool thing to have that. And so for you to be in a place where you can like pass that on to, to your kids, is that something you always thought about or just something that just kind of hit you uh, as you kind of progress through the creative journey of the artist? More the latter, yeah. I, I didn't really think much of it until I started on people like Matt Day who talks about documenting your life a lot. So he does it through photography, but it, you know, being a filmmaker and having the tools that I have, I was like, well, even even just having an iPhone and like regularly committing yeah. to like one of Scout's oldest at bats over the weekend, I like, like that. And every once in a while, just like even if it's just iPhone, uh, because the other night we were making a video for my running channel talking about you know when I used to train five years ago, we went back to, to the trail I used to train on. And I pulled out an old hard drive and I was editing the video and he was right next to me. And we just got completely lost in old footage yeah. of like him as a four-year-old, three-year-old in our condo. And he's just laughing his head off. Like unbelievably profound to make stuff like that. It might be difficult in the moment to commit to making it, but I've also made stuff with my dad in it as well. And I've been able to do show him those films and he's like bawling his eyes out at the end of it. So I've, I've really come to realize like how powerful it is to appeal to personal emotion outside of how it affects happiness. Mm -hmm. So I love making these kind of I just uh, short films. They're really selfish in some regard. Like they might have a sponsor that gets me paid or whatever. But then I also have this heirloom film that we can look at forever. Like I did two short documentaries on my parents that are just like, we have that forever. Yeah. And it's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful depiction of each of them. Yeah. Yeah, the one that your mom kind of like reminded me a little bit of the process that I'm going to do with my grandma. Mm -hmm. Just like being able to like sit her down in her own and like talk to her about her memories. Her mom, like all that stuff. And uh, yeah, it's just like special. It's not like, I want to do that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. It's just extra special to be able to create stuff like that. And now you'll get to like show your daughter one day yeah. and then she'll be able to have, like, she'll be able to tap into your mom's wisdom and your mother's wisdom yeah. and creativity. And, like, I don't know, that, that, to me that like gets me jacked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's super, super special. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like my dad, I did not ask him to do this, but he insisted on sharing that film, like, at the gathering in my aunt's house. Uh, you know, my mom's like, no, don't, don't, you know, and everyone just loved it. So, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I shared, so I'm still in the process of finishing my grandma's documentary, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the 20 minute doc. Yeah. Um, but she passed, passed away a year and a half ago, yeah. and it was fairly sudden. Um, and so I had already created, well, I didn't already create, I had already sat down for a shot and think which was wild. Yeah. So to have that footage was crazy, but then I got to make like a five minute piece to show her, because I told her I would make one. Yeah. So I, like, I was in Paris, long story short, couldn't come back. Ended up being able to come back and see her because she kicked it for another three weeks, weeks which was wild, but I thought she was dying. So all I could do was just like say, three nights in a row, make this. But long story short, to relate to you, I was uh, able to share that at her funeral, like at the luncheon mm -hmm. afterwards. And um, nothing I've ever really made in my life has ever made me cry. And even when I made that, you know, I was making it, like I wasn't crying. Like I had no tears when I was editing. 
Um, but when I stood up there and I played it in front of my whole family and uh, uh, saw the reactions, like that, hit me. and then I broke, like right there, I couldn't even stay to <laughs> Um But also to see, like, my whole family basically just be absolutely moved by a piece. I didn't know that was, like, possible. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, filmmaking is uh, it's a different breed. It's, if you have the ability to do it, to do it on that one, it's the medium that speaks to people more than anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, more than even music, I feel like. Yes, because you can use music within it. Like, Sorry, music. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's the crazy thing. Is like there's. Virtually every art form can be thrown into it. So you just had this wide playground of mm -hmm. appealing to Jewish senses instead of just one. You know, yeah. And yeah, it has a deep impact on people that I just saw it recently. It might have been Ebert who started film reviews. Someone like that. And it was just, he might have even been a writer. Yeah. But not movies, going to the movies mm -hmm. in a way that can appeal to you because the way you get lost in the story, mm -hmm. it allows you to ignore all the tribulation of what's happening peripherally outside of the theater you're in or wherever you're doing it. And it includes the community of empathy with whoever the person is on screen up there going through. And there's just nothing like that. It's so fully in that person's world and feeling for them. Yeah, there's just truth in that. Nothing, bro. Yeah. I just watched, uh, have you heard of the movie Didi? Uh-uh. It's um, uh, an Asian-American coming of age film. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's in theaters anymore. I think it just stopped. <coughs> uh, I guess it's in theaters last week or a week now ago. Um, it's such a great film. And it definitely, like, Films do that, but like not all films, like I said, like truly immerse you like that. Yeah, like you're saying, and that maybe the coming of age ones are. Yeah, yeah, they're crazy. Get a good indie coming of age film. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And they did this thing, not to get into it, but they did this thing where uh, they there were all these scenes where he was like typing on a and typing on oh, yeah. like messenger and stuff, and instead of just you know the classic shot of him at the screen or getting typing keyboards and stuff. It was all screen recordings. Screen recordings, zoom in, zoom out, like, and just like noticing the different things that were happening mm -hmm. and chatting with his friends or his crush. Like, yeah, know, yeah. Getting a smiling face, like, oh, yeah. and then it zooms in and like the sound design on it. It's just done in such a way where you felt like you were in the brain yeah. watching. You're viewing the brain the way he did with all his emotions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So um, Okay. Um, Last question, um, what does it mean, I ask this to everybody, but what does it mean for you to be creative? A creative, yes, but more importantly, what does it mean for you to be creative? So. I equate creativity to excitement. Okay, explain. I think you're not truly being as creative as you can be without being excited to then make the thing. That's my experience. Like, I think I make the most profound stuff when I'm very excited to share it mm -hmm. because I'm so excited to share it. Whether that's narcissistic or not, uh, and that's that's the big debate about artistry. Should art be shared? Should it be for stuff? Um, Rick Rubin, infamous in one of the podcasts recently, talking about how you need to make the art for yourself first before you share it with anyone else. And that's what makes art really good. And then Jacob Collier, one of Colin Samir's podcast, and like clap back super hard on that. And it's like, you know, art is made to be shared and expressed to other people that enjoy. And I agree with way more with this perspective. I think if I find really, like a ton of excitement in what I'm making, I know that there's 
a group of people out there, or maybe just one person out there, that's going to feel the same way. Yeah. And I know the feeling of receiving that art and how it makes me feel and how badly I want to tell the person who made it. Yeah. Like how much it impacted me. Yeah. I know that goes the reverse way. And yep. that if I make it and I'm excited about it, someone else is gonna feel that it's the same exact thing. Yeah. And then, yeah, the beauty of it is that there are these wonderful moments of movie premieres or shakeout runs or whatever where people physically get to meet each other and meet me mm -hmm. and all those feelings and emotions are expressed. Yeah. And I think that's what's so beautiful about being creative is what the feeling of ultimately kind of going back to who do you like to follow in races? Yeah. 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 I see this problem now, and they see this problem in me and the heart and the creativity. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the whole essence of this podcast is the, the name is created to create, mm -hmm. and we're created to create for a reason, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, I don't think God gave us those gifts to just hold on and, and like, keep internally or keep to ourselves. And, and if we're creating things, it doesn't mean you have to share absolutely everything, right? But like the creativity is meant to be shared. He created the earth. He created us to be shared with us, mm -hmm. to be enjoyed. Um, he didn't create redwood trees and then just kind of like create this barrier around them that we can never penetrate, right? Mm -hmm. He created redwood trees and then he gave us the ability to explore that, mm -hmm. touch it, feel it, unfortunately cut it down, mm -hmm. right? Like we have the freedom to do that. And so I think with all the art that we create it's meant to be shared too i would 100 percent agree with that um and more importantly like i'm a firm firm believer that you know if you have a relationship with jesus you have a calling on your life to create in a way whether it's relationships whether it's films whether it's um uh anything really music i don't care what it is spreadsheets you're you really have a divine all in your life to create those things with an amount of excellence and use the gifts that god's given you to impact the people around you and like share those joy moments with the people around you. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's narcissism. I think people can become narcissistic with that and they can make it all about them. But at the end of the day, um, you're helping other people experience the same joy that you're experiencing. So you are impacting people on high levels. It's a very nice I've come to realize that doing things like that and behaving in the way we may behave with having the thing that we do and how it makes us interact with the world as our own sense of creative specifically, that can be something more profound than walking us on and sharing a pamphlet and trying to discuss four points of the gospel. You don't think that's creative, bro? <laughs> <laughs> because, like, that person might see that work that you make and see the divinity of you and yes. see God's plan and how he made you and you mm -hmm. express that and the, 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 the countless experiences I've had of people being connected through making things is wildly yeah. profound because of all this it's the intrigue and interest of people to come to you to start asking you questions instead of you imposing on them. Mm -hmm. I think that's really something very, very profound. True evangelism right there. True evangelism is the, the, the personal testimony of you just living your life. Yeah. And it creates that intrigue. Yeah. For sure. Um, I think like another, like part of the Great Commission is um, like cultivating relationships to you. And to, to bring it back to your pamphlet example, um, there's not a lot of relationship there. Yeah. Um, uh, but there is a relationship in the wall. And being so insanely gifted and stewarding the gift that got me so well to the point where someone goes, who, who is this guy? Why is he so good at this? Like, he made this film and made you just feel a certain way. Like, who is this? And, like, brings him to a point where they ask a question about it. And then that's where you're like, 
maybe not even right away, you're like, oh, Jesus, but you're just explaining, hey, these are the things in my life that led me to even making that film. Mm -hmm. And then that's even a conversation in and of itself that right. could lead to that one. No doubt. Yeah. yeah. Cool, bro. Thanks for the chat. Thank it's been you. Fun. Thanks for lending us your couch yeah. <laughs> in your studio. Um, thanks for having us. And yeah, I don't know. It's just, I was really excited for this conversation and even more so just to like continue our friendship because I feel like we haven't really had the opportunity to have like more of a deeper conversation. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you. appreciate your willingness to go out and just be the best that you possibly can when you do your shows. I definitely shows. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Of course. See you guys.